is it fair to say that Formula One is your favourite sport, the one that you've grown up with? I mean, because you're across so many. Rugby, we've just touched on. Formula One, tennis, yeah. Olympics. Like the biggest sports, but I get the sense that Formula One is the one. Formula One is all-encompassing just because it has taken up so much of my life, um, which wasn't really a, a conscious choice. It's just uh, the way it worked out. And I think, um, you know, now there's 23 races a year. You don't do all the races. Uh, nobody in their right mind, apart from the drivers, do all the races, but then they have a bit of financial gain and they're flying in their own planes. Um, so we split the presentation. You know, when I first got into it, there were maybe 18 races a year or something, and it would take up um, half, over half, three quarters of the year. Now it's almost wall to wall. So by default, it becomes your life. And I do absolutely love it. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't say it was um, they are above rugby or above doing Wimbledon. I think w when you break it down, um, You'll be some races that you don't enjoy. There'll be some races that you absolutely love. A little bit like, you know, I love the Six Nations and I love Wimbledon. So you can actually like, you know, sections of rugby or sections of tennis, as it were. Um, and there are some races which are fantastic. And I love the places that we go to. And there are others where you're a bit like, hmm, do I really want to go to that one? Mm. Um, but it's uh, it's everything. It's entertainment. It's politics. It's you know, some of the highest class sport. There's an element of danger. There's everything really rolled into Formula One, but that people are starting to see now because of all the uh, behind the scenes programmes that, that go on. Um, but I've been part of it since a very early age. I was the annoying kid that turned up at so many different sports events, which was fantastic because I was exposed to so much. And then I was like, people can get paid to do this? Sign me up. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I kind of was working in sport from the age of 15 onwards. And I, I did news as well. I did the Lockerbie trial and, uh, you know, general elections and things too. Um, but there's just something about sport that, that I find really engaging. Mm. So in the, is it the foreword? The foreword. At the yeah. start? Yes. The introduction, introduction, I was going to call it. You spoke about something quite powerful. And it was being at the race, the Ayrton Senna past I, my father was there i was watching it on tv oh, i was watching, yeah so your father i was, was there so you got i mean that was one of the first things i imagine that you yeah saw it was um so i used to watch formula one because i couldn't quite understand where my dad went every weekend i was like this is really weird he's on so the jolly yeah he's on the jolly so that's why i started watching sport because it was a sort of understanding as you know as to where your family vanished off to and I was watching that race. Um, my father was there. He ended up going to Ayrton's funeral uh, in Brazil. And that was the, that whole weekend, actually. We, we focus on the Sunday. Um, but the Friday, there was a massive accident for Rubens Barrichello. The Saturday, there was a massive accident which resulted in the death of Roland Ratzenberger. And then the Sunday, there was a, the accident. Um, this is all at the same racetrack, Imola, that claimed the life of Ayrton Senna. So as a weekend for a young girl watching sport and me thinking that sport was a great fun place that you go to lose yourself or just have a couple of hours watching something suddenly took quite a, a nasty turn because you realise that some sports are not just dangerous, but they can claim lives. And that one weekend was I suddenly realised the enormity of what can happen, you know, in, in Formula One terms. Yeah, it was, I mean, crazy. And you saw the scene. Yeah. And I, I recently, I, I used to watch Formula One. I do watch a little bit of it now. Yeah. Big shout out to Drive to Survive. They got me back into it, like millions of others in America as well. Yeah. Danny Ricardo, never heard of him before. Did I call him Danny? You can call him Danny. Can I call he, him Danny? He, he's, um, he, he would like you to call him Danny. He'd oh, be right. fine. Yeah. He's a good guy. Daniel. Daniel Ricciardo. Danny Rick. So, yeah, that's when you know. That actually, so I, I was a Formula One fan. Yeah. So gr growing up, watching Schumacher, yeah. um, Ferrari, the, all the icon, yeah. the easy stuff to watch, like watching Monaco, had the yeah. Formula One game yeah, as well, which I absolutely loved, like just rinsing people on the outside in Monaco. And uh, you can't overtake that, can you? It's a hard place to overtake yeah. in Monaco. Not in the game, it's not. You just fly down the inside, rip your wheels off. Um, <laughs> so I... I used to love Formula One and then just didn't have the time to watch it and then yeah. now I've got back into it like a really interesting sport because of the 
it's and this is what drives the survive shows. It's the glitz, the glamour, the money, the travel. Yeah. It is I mean, it's quite an unbelievable setup when you think about it. And you like you being involved in that, yeah. and this is a two prong question. So with the glitz and the glamour, everything that goes with it, I know there's a lot of travel and we can get onto that, like how you manage that. But also being a woman in that environment, because from what I see, it's all men. Where are there many other women involved? Yeah, there are. There are. There like are. When, when I first started, my first full season in F1 was 2009. But I'd been, I'd done all the support races just like the drivers do. You know, very few people turn up in F1. You've got to start and, and work your way up, uh, which is what I did. And uh, going back to like, say, 2005, there weren't that many. Um, but there are always more. You know, at the beginning, I suppose, there were grid girls and catering girls and a few journalists. Um, and now there are a lot more journalists. There's a lot more female presence. There are engineers, um, you know, there are strategists sitting on the pit wall, which I think is really important. People spend their life asking me about, you know, when will there be the next um, female Formula One driver? And I work with um, some different uh, sort of projects and commissions and I don't want to just focus on the next female driver. I want to focus on um, engineers and strategists, which is a bit ironic because these are, you know, your STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, um, mathematics, basically four subjects that I wasn't allowed near at school because I wasn't remotely bright enough. But I think it's really empowering and important to uh, show to young girls that they can sit on a pit wall and they can determine race strategy and some of the you know, the great females um, or the great strategists out there are, are female, but you maybe don't get to see that as mm. much. So it's not like I'm the only female wandering around. You do sometimes get on a plane because quite often we charter flights and sometimes you get on it and you'll look around and you'll be like, yeah, all I see is mass, massive men. But mm. you, I don't even really notice it because it's my work. And and you've been in it you all just, your life yeah, as well. Yeah, you just sort of like get on with it. Um, yeah, it's not something that really... Stands out for me. So, uh, women can race, can they? If if there was a woman that came through that was good enough, she'd be able to race. One hundred percent. And has that happened before? Yeah, there, my have, there have been female Formula One drivers in the past. Um, you know, not for a very long time. We're getting on fifty years now. But uh, there are. I've presented for the last few years a, a all female racing series, which I wasn't sure about when it first started off because. You know, my background would be equestrian or I've, I've done some co-driving in the World Rally Championship as well. But I couldn't quite understand why women needed their own series. So I went out to Spain and I spoke spoke to all the girls and some of them were uh, were very talented and I knew that. I just didn't understand why they hadn't got on. They just said there was absolutely no sponsorship or uh, opportunity available for them. So I thought, well, they would know more than I do. I'd formed the wrong opinion, so I started to present it. And... Um, and that has been a springboard for them to go. So Jamie Chadwick won the, the championship for the last three years. She's now racing in America. Um, and there are some really, really talented young girls coming through sort of 18, 19. But as I say, you don't just start in Formula One. Mm. So it's going to take time for the person to get to Formula One standards. And also, I think it's really worth saying as well, you don't want someone there just for tokenism because the... The, the spotlight is going to be so hard on whoever that female driver is. She can't be average. And there have been a few guys over the years who have been on the grid that it's always discussed, you know, should they have been there? Have they bought their place there? Um, you, That has happened. But this poor girl, whoever it's going to be, this blessed girl, is going to have to be absolutely at the peak and as tough as she can be because every single thing she does is going to be scrutinised. But she needs to be there on merit. That's the most important thing for me. There can be no tokenism. She needs to be there on merit. Otherwise, it undoes all the, all the efforts that have been made for the past few years. Can you see it happening? I can see it happening, but I can't see it happening in the next uh, three, four or five years. Mm. And because there's so much money investment and the way that the sport is it's naught point will you be able to tell me naught point naught 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 one and stuff like that as in some ridiculous numbers of winning losing second third and the money and everything that comes with that and the science 
and everything. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I th- were we talking, or did I hear you talk about when you look at what people in the Formula One industry, the very best engineers, they've invented stuff that yeah has a lot of people don't realise there's that there's Formula One and there's then there's the applied science that goes with it. So um, some of the teams have this applied science thing. So, for example. Um, you know, a lot of the bikes, so McLaren, I, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have specialised. So before an Olympics or any big bike race, the, those bikes would go in the same wind tunnel as the McLaren F1 cars. Um, so because and, and the toboggans um, for the British Olympic team, Winter Olympic team would go in because it's all aerodynamics. But there's also not a lot of other stuff as well. You know, Great Ormond Street, they um, have a lot of uh, incubators that have been developed through Formula One technology. The fridges in your supermarket, the cooling system that goes on. It used to be that when you walked, uh, you know, down the aisle to get your milk or butter, you'd be absolutely freezing. You know, you'd need a ski jacket to go down there. Now you don't get that same thing because of the cooling system, which is actually in the fridges, recycles that air. That comes from the cooling system of a Formula One car. Uh, Singapore whole transport network comes from McLaren technology and the way that planes move around at Heathrow it's exactly the same technology as doing a Formula One pit stop getting a plane into position getting the people on getting the people off and then getting out the way for the next one to come in Mm. I mean and and when I ask about the science I'll go back to the question when we're talking about a woman racer coming in because the amount of science and investment to look into that space, I mean, it's obvious, right? In rugby, a woman can't play in the men's game mm. because of the contact element. But from a racing point of view, have they looked into anything why there aren't more women yeah, it, I, around the brain, around... There's been so many different discussions. No matter who you speak to, everybody has a, an opinion on it. I mean, um, I heard an interesting study which was being uh, done on how to get more... Um, Japanese, Chinese racing drivers, because obviously there's huge, vast amounts of money. There have been a lot of Japanese racing drivers uh, over the years. We have our first Chinese racing driver just now in Formula One. Um, and actually, there's a there's a study which is comparing uh, females actually to the, the body prototype of, say, a Japanese racing driver, because they tend to be smaller, lighter. Formula One also is, um, you know, the, the driver's are slightly like jockeys. They're a lot shorter than you'd think they were. They have a weight limit. Um, there's, uh, you know, they, they have, you know, 3%, 2% fat in some cases. When you speak to a Mark Webber, who is a tall driver, David Cothar, Jensen Button, the perfect example of that. These guys were so light, in fact, still are so light. It's incredible. But they have put their bodies into that position. Um, so, you know, the, the smaller and lighter you are, the more benefit in many ways that there is. Um, so, yeah, it's, if it's anything, it's, it's di- more difficult in the support races where the cars don't have power steering. Um, that's where, it, you know, a, a female might be more hampered than actually in Formula One. 